Hello, friends. This is Maureen Lee Maloney, and welcome back to My Doc Journey, the show where I reveal every step in my process of creating a feature length documentary, even the steps where I fall down and cry. Hello. Oh, man. It is so good to be back from my COVID hiatus. I hope you're all safe and healthy out there wherever you are and that you're finding some way of being productive. I have a really cool interview today with Alana DeJoseph and her film A Towering Task. It's really appropriate to have her as my first interview because her film is about the history of the Peace Corps and my film Voice of Vanilla is very much inspired by by my Peace Corps service in Madagascar. Uh, Alana was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali. And other than that, I think I'll just let her tell her own story. So without further ado, here's my interview with Alana De Joseph. Welcome to my Dr. D. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thank you for having me. First, I just want to say about the film You know, it is hard, as a return Peace Corps volunteer, it is hard to explain to people just how much of an impact the Peace Corps had on my life. But then also, I think, to explain how much of an impact the Peace Corps has on the world. And uh, I think this film just does such a fantastic job of that. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Success. You succeeded. (laughs) So um, tell me a little bit about uh, your Peace Corps service. Where did you serve and what did you do? So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali in West Africa from 1992 until 1994. So I fell into the pre-internet era. uh, We were not able to stream Netflix or Skype home. Um, But um, but, uh, I'm sure the experience was not all that different. Uh, I was a small enterprise development advisor, which meant that in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of us were graduating with business degrees. There was a renewed focus for the Peace Corps on its first goal, which is more around development, and they wanted to have um, business people teach uh, microfinance, revolving loan funds and such, which were all the rage at the time and um, have since grown into quite the uh, um, development effort and, and important effort. Um, at the time, it was still fairly early on in the process. I was in a village of a thousand people. Most of them were subsistence farmers. And so there wasn't a hell of a lot of entrepreneurship going on. Um, I had to create a lot of my own work. There, uh, there were some um, uh, women who were doing pottery in a village over, and I worked with them a fair amount. And then there was a gentleman who had a motorcycle shop um, at in another town that was on the paved road, and I worked with him a little bit. And um, there were some young girls that came over, and uh, we did a little bit of numeracy and alphabetization and uh, and geography. I had a map of Africa uh, taped to my or stuck to my um, mud brick wall of my hut, and um, I you know point in one direction, say if you keep walking in this direction, then uh, you're going to get to the Ivory Coast. If you keep walking in this direction, you're going to get to Senegal and so so on. Um, and then uh, Mali uh, has uh, several different languages. I think it's 14 or 16 different languages. Wow. And um, But the official language is French. The colonial language is French. And so um, it behooves people who want to get ahead in Mali to learn French. But at the same time, because I was a Peace Corps volunteer, a lot of people would approach me to teach them English. But they wouldn't want to actually learn English. It was more about that they wanted to go to America. And so you get a little jaded as a Peace Corps volunteer. You have the hundredth person approach. You say, teach me English. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you want to go to America and be rich. And he said, no. The young man who approached me, he said, no. I have a friend who's from Ghana. And I would like to be able to talk to him. And I felt so humble. (laughs) And so sorry. And he became my English student for the whole time that that I was there. So I cobbled together quite a bit of work. during my Peace Corps experience, but uh, being a Peace Corps volunteer, of course, I also had quite a bit of free time and read a lot of books and visited my fellow Peace Corps volunteers and so on. 
Well, that sounds like a great experience. And so then, you know, getting into um, more of your your path as a documentary filmmaker, um, did you always want to become a documentary filmmaker or like how did you get into that? Well, for me, it actually started on the talent side. So I was born and raised in Germany and um, Germans prefer to have their films dubbed rather than subtitled. So it's a big industry in Germany. And um, one of the uh, one of the things much needed in, in, German, in the German dubbing industry is children's voices, because of course you can't just recruit children from the street and you don't have children applying for those jobs. And so um, I got into film dubbing as a 10 year old in Germany. Wow. Um, dubbing Lucy for the peanuts and and and, and things like that. Oh my gosh. And um, as I, you know, really enjoy that industry, I realized I would prefer to be on the other side of the camera. I wanted to be the one controlling the story, uh, molding the story, and yeah. and directing where it all went. And uh, then I went to college in the United States and um, to Washington Lee University, and I merged my uh, theater degree with a business degree and. Uh, and had grand plans of, of building a theater and, and uh, running a theater. Whoa. And, um, but wanted to postpone that because I decided I needed to join the Peace Corps first. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Peace Corps. And by the time I came back out from the Peace Corps, I had this notion it had to be more around documentaries. And, um, and, uh, and so I started working for people in the camera department. I worked as a grip. I worked as a teleprompter operator. I worked at the local PBS affiliate. Um, I worked my way up through all the different fields until um, this wise lady, uh, her name was Brie Murphy. She was a camera woman from Hollywood for B-horror -mo movies. She was working the big 35 millimeter cameras as when there were no women in the industry. And she said, you know, if you want to tell your own stories, you need to stop trying to be the second assistant to the B camera. You need to pick up a camera and start working on documentaries. And so that's what I did. And here we are. <laughs> so true. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> nice. So then when did you decide to make the Peace Corps film? Well, I used to think that I didn't come up with the idea or the thought about the plan for it until um, a few years ago. But recently going through my Peace Corps papers, I found a letter that I wrote right after my Peace Corps service to the Peace Corps saying, I would like to do a documentary about the Peace Corps. <laughs> and, um, and then getting a very polite letter back from the Peace Corps um, that said something along the lines of when, when you have your ducks in a row, you come and contact us. But until then, um, you might want to prepare and, and figure out exactly what it is that you want to do. And it was very nice. And they, they realized that this was very much off the top of my head. And my life took me in other directions and other documentaries. And I started working um, with the Forest Service. And the Forest Service was approaching its centennial in 2005. And um, they were producing a big historical documentary for, uh, um, for the centennial and that later then aired on public television. And uh, I got to be associate producer on that production. And of course, realized the Peace Corps could use a documentary just like that. It's much younger than the Forest Service, but at the same time, there's a lot less documentation about it out there. And we found that there were several return Peace Corps volunteers on the Forest Service production. And then there were several return Peace Corps volunteers on the next production I worked on, a documentary about Elder Leopold, where it's also associate producer. Um, and, uh, and we said, well, we should do a documentary about the Peace Corps. Is there anything like this out there? And there wasn't. There were some smatterings of documentaries about individual volunteer experiences, but there wasn't any big overarching historical documentary. And then, and then somebody faithfully said, well, there ought to be the money for that, right? <laughs> and that's when we embarked uh, six and a half years ago now. It took, the whole production took six years wow. um, to, uh, to tell this very complex story. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And that sounds like um, a great, so you already had kind of a team to, to go with it from the beginning. That's amazing. So then you've got your team and what were kind of your, your first steps? Like what, what was your pre-production like? Well, so we had the thought kind of the theoretical decision was made in spring of 2013. 
And, um, and so then I started getting pig buying books on the Peace Corps, trying to get my hands on any historical information I could. And we, with the Forest Service film, we had been lucky. There was an official Forest Service historian, a man who's, who was a professor and who everybody turned to about Forest Service history. But there was no such thing for the Peace Corps. So we didn't have this one person that would be the authoritative voice who we could interview who would then give us the whole picture. And we had to cobble it together. There were writers who wrote about the founding years, and they were wonderful interviews, like Jerry Rice, who wrote The Bold Experiment. Mm -hmm. um, there were journalists like Stanley Meisler, who wrote um, um, When the World Calls, and a, a book that covers more of the entirety of the Peace Corps history, but not... Uh, at a professor scholarly uh, level. So there's Elizabeth Cobb's book, which is All You Need Is Love, The Peace Corps in the Spirit of the 1960s, which on a more scholarly level covers more of the agency's history, but ends in the 90s, I believe. So it doesn't come all the way to current day. So we had to put it together and, and we had got these great voices and everybody could speak to a different era and to a different level and to a different aspect of it. But it made for a very different documentary because not only did we need the scholars and journalists that were telling the story, we also needed the Peace Corps voices because over and over we heard, well, you can't tell the Peace Corps story without interviewing the volunteers mm -hmm. and the staff and the current volunteers, former volunteers, current staff, former staff, um, who know that on the ground experience. And then most importantly, you have to get those host country national voices in because mm -hmm. They're the ones who are experience the peace, experiencing the Peace Corps most saliently. So, um, so I was trying to talk to everybody I could, getting the books that I could, reading any kind of dissertations and theses people had written about the Peace Corps. And I was dragging my feet because I was, on the one hand, the whole delving into fundraising for a major documentary is always ominous. Um, and then, and then uh, once you make that first step, right, you have started the, the production. And I, I was just delved, I was just wallowing in theoretical knowledge and yeah. trying not to force myself to get started. And then a return Peace Corps volunteer told me, well, there is the all Honduras reunion. So meaning all volunteers who've ever served in Honduras were invited to come to Estes Park um, in October of 2013 for a reunion. And I live in Denver, <laughs> an hour and a half away. So it seemed like that had to be the perfect place to start recording interviews and, um, and step from the theoretical into the practical. And so we, like, I hired a camera operator and we hauled our way up to Estes Park. And within a day and a half, we recorded 13 interviews, which wow. is... An amazing amount. And I was really just getting my feet wet and figuring out how do we do these interviews? Because on the one hand, I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer. So a lot of the thoughts in my head are very inside baseball. There's a lot of, well, you know, should the Peace Corps be doing that? Or what is the whole purpose in the long run and the philosophical part? When really America at this time is forgetting that there is a Peace Corps and doesn't even really understand what the Peace Corps does. So I needed to slowly dial back and go back to basics and ask mm -hmm. volunteers, what did you do? And um, what does, how does that affect you now? And, and get the actual hard facts rather than philosophizing of what the Peace Corps should and should not do. Um, and so my interviewing skills evolved over the six years that we produced this documentary and, um, and the questions changed definitely, but uh, that's how we, it started with a bang, right? It started with the All Honduras reunion. And I think um, in the fall of this year, there is a new All Honduras reunion coming up, hopefully, if we can all gather again um, as people. And um, I'm hoping to be there so that we can celebrate the full circle of having finished this documentary that started with all those guys. That is cool. So it also kind of sounds a little bit like um, maybe your, your vision for the story that you were telling changed a little bit during that too? Absolutely. Um, I think, I think um, one of the big things uh, when you start a documentary is that you want, you think about it very critically. You, especially a documentary about a government agency that has become something like mom's apple pie, right? That is beloved, that is an icon just by its name. 
you start off with everybody saying, oh, but don't just tell the good parts. Make sure you tell the whole story. And, mm -hmm. and you want to be sure that you tell the whole story. And so oftentimes when, when you start this effort, all these critical thoughts are in your mind. Well, what about the white savior complex? Well, what about Peace Corps not handling volunteer safety very well? What about Peace Corps obsessing over safety and not letting volunteers be volunteers? And, <laughs> and all these super critical thoughts when, when what was needed was going back to the beginning and figuring mm -hmm. out, okay, what is it in the first place? So that then the audience, when they see the film, they can uh, arrive at those thoughts themselves because they will have a better understanding of the Peace Corps. They will be honorary Peace Corps volunteers and have their own critical thoughts as they go. Um, and, and, you know, the love at the same time. I think mm -hmm. anybody who knows the Peace Corps has a mixed bag of emotions about it. There's, yeah. a, there's a deep, profound love and a deep, profound criticism of it at the same time. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, and the and the film definitely does a good job of um, showing both of those sides, you know, I think. Um, so you had some uh, producing experience going into this, and I'm sure that really helped a lot. Um, did you reach out to other producers to work with? Well, um, Dave Steinke, who, who was a pr producer and director also on the Forest Service documentary, is associate producer on a towering task and he uh he is not a, a return peace corps volunteer nor is he a former staff member so he's from outside of the peace corps community which was very important for me as was our um writer shauna kelly uh, neither of them are return peace corps volunteers and it was so important that if we're going to do a documentary that is intended for a wide public audience and not just the Peace Corps um, community, then we need to understand and produce this documentary from the perspective of the American audience and not from the perspective of the, Pe of the Peace Corps community. And so um, Dave has been a sage counsel throughout the process and has been a wonderful person to be able to turn to. Also, um, uh, advising on the documentary were, were uh, Anne and Steve Dunsky, who were also producer directors on the Forest Service documentary. And I shouldn't say that the Forest Service documentary's name is the greatest good. Um, and uh, so while we were in the edit process, I edited the film myself and that's because I'm a micromanager and I need to try stuff out and it takes me hours. And if I had to pay somebody um, to do that, <laughs> we would have gone broke and the documentary would have cost 10 times as much. Um, but Annie is an incredibly gifted editor. And so I would turn to Ann Dunsky and, and, and send her segments and ask her about sections. And she would give these great detailed notes back. And, um, and so I, I, not only did we have the great team, we also had advisors that we could turn to that would keep us straight and keep us from turning into inside baseball or, or getting too hung up on one part piece of the story. Yes, I think that's, that's valuable to note that um, you can have kind of like that team of people to just sort of like advise you at certain stages that will help you out. Um, I definitely have like a few people that I that I count on to be like, what do you think about this? And, <laughs> you know, you yeah. don't have to pull everybody into your film full time, but you can have those people who who you can kind of lean back on from time to time. <laughs> Especially the ones who have been following you along the way, because when you're so deep in the woods, you don't want to be turning to somebody who's never seen anything of it before, but who has a bit of an understanding of what the thought process is and, mm -hmm. and how you arrived at where you're arriving, but who can still look at it from the outside and say, well, this is the first time I'm seeing it and this is the impression I'm getting. Um, because oftentimes we found ourselves talking to somebody who had not seen any any part of it before and they would bring up 500 other subjects that she, we should be covering in the documentary and we had to keep reminding them this is a documentary about the entire history of the Peace Corps and people are gonna raise eyebrows if we go over an hour and a half and, yeah, and it yeah. is when we're at an hour and 47 minutes and people are still in the same breath telling us well you should have covered this and you should have covered that yeah. and you should have covered that and the film's a little long. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Lord knows. Uh, I think um, most documentary subjects can probably go on for much, much longer and definitely shorting, shortening it down to a watchable length is, is in the end, probably one of the hardest things to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I'm curious about uh, how you found your crew for the film. Were they mostly people that you had worked with before? 
Well, so so our core crew was people that I'd worked with before, um, and um, and and so we knew each other. But these this documentary took a lot of production trips, so we found ourselves in lots of different U.S. cities. We found ourselves in three different countries. So I had to hire a crew um, every time that we went outside of Denver, and. Um, and you know some documentaries and some um, um, productions have either have a budget to have the same person and fly them everywhere, um, or you know the director producer has their own camera pack and does it all themselves. And we kind of fell into that in between where I did not have the camera gear, nor did I want to have to focus on technicalities when I wanted to focus on getting the good interview and and mm -hmm. getting the right shots and everything. Um, but I also did not have the budget to fly one one camera person everywhere. I loved Vanessa Carr was our main director of photography and she was wonderful and she worked on all three international trips um, and a few of the domestic trips as well. And she was great to work with. I would have loved to fly her everywhere, but we weren't able to do that. At the same time, I was able to hire some amazing talent around the country and, and get some diverse perspectives in there too of, of different camera operators. And um, you know as well as I do that the field of, of filmmaking is very dominated uh, by males and, and, and white males at that. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I could hire female camera operators, whenever I could hire some more diverse backgrounds, I, I did because it just helped in how we told the story. And at the end of every interview, um, I would always turn around and say, okay, what other questions do you have? Because I think it's so important to get those questions that don't come from the prefab mind of the director. Uh, so, so I would usually ask for recommendations. I, I found okay. that in the production world, it's a matter of trust, right? We, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have one shot to interview Jimmy Carter, and I cannot have the camera operator tell me after the interview that they forgot to hit record or that a light bulb burned out or something like that, because mm -hmm. I will never, ever be able to do that interview again. So I have to trust that whoever I hire is going to be, is going to be on top of it, is going to be able to get me the shot. And that trust comes from somebody else who I know and trust recommending this person. And there are some great outlets, like uh, um, there's some groups on Facebook and there are some other organizations where you can meet and, and get to know other people in the production industry. Um, but at the end of the day, I needed that word of trust. I needed that seal of approval from somebody that I knew uh, would produce the quality and, and, and would know that these were one-time shots. When we sat down with the president of Liberia, the sitting head of state, Vanessa Carr was there and she was probably just as nervous as I was <laughs> you know, hoping to get my questions straight and, and not committing any faux pas and her knowing that if she did not get this technically right, we wouldn't get it. Yeah, totally. That, you know, um, definitely asking for recommendations from people sounds like a really good way to go. And I know in my own experience too, where I've tried to do camera work I've tried to be like the DP and the director. It is really hard because it's hard. There's so much technically to focus on with the camera. And then it's hard to also then focus on that person and asking the questions and reacting and, and uh, listening actively to what your person is saying. So yeah, to any to anybody listening out there who thinks, oh, I'll do camera and direct at the same time, you know, getting a, getting a DP, getting a camera person is definitely helpful. And I like that idea that your DP might come up with some great questions that you don't think of too. That is cool. And you, you need that other person too, especially if you're doing long productions, just having somebody else to bounce ideas off of somebody mm -hmm. else who, who observes what's going on and will have a different perspective and somebody at the end of the day that you can, that you can have happy hour, enjoy happy hour with yes. <laughs> debrief, debrief the yeah. and watch the dailies <laughs> and decide what we need for the next day and such. It's just mm -hmm. really good to have another person there than to just be in your own mind, not to disparage by any means, those filmmakers that go out and for months on end with them and their camera and, and capturing amazing stuff. I admire that. I mm -hmm. wish I was able to do that. And maybe one day I'll be able to do that. <laughs> but I, at, at this point, I just really am thrilled not to have to do all the technical part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, so uh, the big question, um, what, what was your fundraising strategy for this? It was, it was a very all encompassing fundraising strategy. We, we had to pull out all the stops. So we wrote some grants, but getting grants for historical documentaries is notoriously difficult. Mm. Um, documentaries that deal with current issues, well, documentaries in general have a hard time getting funding, but documentaries who deal with current issues, that deal with current issues, tend to have a little bit of an easier time than documentaries that deal with historical subject matters. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're headed to public television. So many of those documentaries are funded on the front end by public television dollars um, or grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and such. And so we were not terribly successful with grants. Uh, we were we submitted multiple times and we got better and better at it, but we never really um, figured it out to the degree where we would just fund the entire documentary with grants. Um, we had uh, some, some angel investors who helped, um, who were you know, from the Peace Corps community, former staff, former volunteers, people who got why the subject matter was important. And we did a crowdfunding campaign. And so really the whole documentary was funded very much by a large community. We had over a thousand individual donations that made up our budget. And that allowed us to produce this documentary to the broadcast level, the standard that it has been produced to, um, which in a way I think is a wonderful long-term way of funding a documentary. Mm -hmm. If you are able to find that community that is interested in this documentary, because now these, everybody who funded the documentary is also interested in seeing its success. They're interested in yeah. seeing it up there. And the reason they wanted to see it produced is because they want to show it to their friends and family who don't understand the Peace Corps. And so it perpetuates itself. There is an audience out there now who, who are passionate about it and who are helping us get the documentary out um, to the American public. Yeah, I like that thought because it's really, um, you can sort of reframe the the task of fundraising as the opportunity to find your audience um, and the, the people who will want to watch it in the end. So yeah, that's huge. We had a great built-in audience with this because um, we knew that, you know, so in the, in, in the 70s, at some point, you know, Nixon did not come in opposed to the Peace Corps, but at some point, Vietnam protests, uh, uh, volunteers protesting their own government got to Nixon and he was ready to get rid of the Peace Corps. But at the time, Americans knew what the Peace Corps was. So it would have been a very difficult proposal to try to completely phase out the Peace Corps as he was it phrased it. Um, today, most of America does not remember what the Peace Corps is. I would also venture to guess that a lot of Americans wouldn't notice the difference whether the Peace Corps was in the State Department and not, or not and wouldn't necessarily know why that matters. Um, and if the current administration decided to phase out the Peace Corps, it might not register on a lot of people's radar. And so it's just been so important to, to talk about the Peace Corps now, to get that message out. So, uh, and I think a lot of return Peace Corps volunteers, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, staff and former staff realize that. And so there's a real passion to not only re-inform America what the Peace Corps is, reacquaint America with the Peace Corps, but go beyond that and have, America really have a visceral understanding of what it is uh, that they might lose if the Peace Corps was ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I know uh, the Peace Corps funding these days is very low. Some of the countries are really struggling. I know Madagascar, where I serve, the country is struggling and having to really limit um, the, the services they offer, which is unfortunate you know, especially for a country like Madagascar that really needs all the help that they can get, you know. That's... The, bud the budget for the Peace Corps has always been relatively tight. Mm -hmm. um, this, it's never been a huge budget. And, and, you know, in the 80s, Lorette Rupi compared it to uh, the entire budget of the Peace Corps is, is less than the marching bands of the military, of the U.S. military. Um, or, or it's the right wing of some bomber or something like that. It's, um, it's really quite small mm -hmm. and um, it's been stagnant now for several years 
And of course, every year there's a proposed cut to the budget, which luckily Congress so far has been um, uh, countering and it stayed, it stayed level. But um, with inflation and, and everything going on, the extra costs, um, that's really hard because it really equa equates to a shrinking budget. And then now with COVID-19, all mm -hmm. Peace Corps volunteers are evacuated. Yeah. We have some staff still in country uh, and the posts are staying open. And the intent is that once the pandemic passes for volunteers to go back, but it puts Peace Corps in a very precarious spot. Because going back is not as easy as just pushing a button. These are volunteers that are now back in the United States. They have to find work. They need mm -hmm. to find some kind of income. Uh, and people are dispersing. Yeah. Who, somebody might have had the intent to be a Peace Corps volunteer, but how long do you wait before you have to start your life back in the United States, your career again? Mm -hmm. And um, so it'll take time. And it'll take time before Peace Corps volunteers can safely serve again and not be exposed to the pandemic and um, and, uh, and and build, rebuilding to the 7,300 some odd Peace Corps volunteers that were out in the field in 60 plus countries is going to take time. So the Peace Corps is incredibly vulnerable right now. And with, a, with an America that doesn't know or understand or love the Peace Corps, like, like I believe they should, um, it's a, it's a difficult time for the Peace Corps for sure. Yeah. Yes, definitely a difficult time for a lot of really important organizations, but I definitely uh, think the Peace Corps is, is an underappreciated one there. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, so getting back to the six years that it took you to make the film, I'm curious about how long each stage took, like each sort of pre-production, production, post, um, or were you sort of kind of mixing it? Were you doing it all pretty much the whole time there? Well, there was definitely a lot of overlap. So so um, I noticed that, you know, when we apply, when we uh we have a fiscal sponsor and when we write for funding to our fiscal sponsor, there's a form in which we have to check the boxes is for pre-production, for production, post-production distribution. And I don't think ever during the entire production did I check just one box when I sent in the form for funding. <laughs> it was always multiple boxes. Um, but there definitely was a shift where at the beginning it was pre-production and production that I was checking and then it was just production and then it was production, post-production and it was uh, post-production distribution that I was checking. So I was slowly making my way through that form. Um, as with that, that, that all Honduras reunion, we stumbled into production pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh, as we went from, from pre-production being really just me gathering understanding and knowledge about the history of the Peace Corps into jumping two feet into a full-on reunion with uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers, that happened pretty quickly. And then we needed to continue pre-production because we needed to write the script. And the script, as you know, as a documentarian, is something you write, you rewrite, and you rewrite, and then you rewrite it again. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, first you write the script of, this is the documentary I have in mind that I want to make. Then you write the script of, oh, these are the sound bites coming in, and this is how this is morphing and how this is changing, and I'm changing my opinion of what I want to be telling. And then, and then you're like, okay, and now my documentary is four hours long, and nobody's going to watch it, so now we need to cut this down into something palatable and, and something digestible that really makes for the compelling story and yet hits all the marks that we need to hit. And, um, and so that pre-production, um, that script uh part that continued throughout um our production we i think we recorded our last interviews in may and we premiered the film in september yeah. so it was pretty tight and mm -hmm. it really was the last interviews where we where we knew we had pretty much all our all of our sound bites but then we were talking about hiv aids in um in in the 80s in Africa, and um, we didn't have any volunteers talking about it. So suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, we need a volunteer who talks about this. And um, and we saved our last interview with our historian, who we, we interviewed her twice. We interviewed her at the beginning of the process, and then we interviewed her again at the end, because we knew, okay, we want her to specifically talk to this point, and we have a hole right here that needs to be filled and such. And um, so we had interviews pretty close into the post-production post process. And then post-production, you know, editing, I was, I was editing the moment the first interviews came in because of course, while you, when you're fundraising, you have to have some kind of spec trailer thing mm -hmm. or, or preview True, thing that you yeah. can show, show people. And, um, that has to be edited. And, um, 
So shortly after our first interviews, we were in post-production for some of the elements. And, um, and, then, and then, of course, all the members of the crew of the post-production wished that they, they had a whole year to work on it. But by that time, we're like, okay, now we're in three months, we're premiering, so you better get it together. <laughs> um, and so we, we had to help them to and hire on a few more people that, that, that could help them because everybody else was pulling their hair out saying, we, we, we can't get this ready by the premiere. Um, so there was a lot of overlap, uh, and I, I think that's okay, and, and, and that makes for a very organic process of the story evolving, um, but there, there weren't any clear cuts. I can't say uh, out of those uh, six years, it took two years to do this, two years to do that, three years mm -hmm. to do that. I would say it took six, six years of pre-production, six years of production, and six years of post-production, <laughs> yeah. and now it's going to take another six years of distribution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I imagine uh, that was the 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 film was changing, and the script, as you say, was changing a lot. Probably a lot due to your archival footage, which you have tons of great um, videos, photos, and I was really amazed by the recordings of the president's phone calls. And so I was hoping you could speak a little bit to how you collected all this footage, um, where you got it from, how you sort of organized it. But also, I'm really curious, are all the president's phone calls recorded? Like, how did you get those? <laughs> well, the beauty, um, since we were dealing with political issues, we worked really closely with the presidential libraries. Mm -hmm. And... I, I have to say, first of all, most credit of this goes to Shana Kelly, our screenwriter, who also became our archival research coordinator. Uh -huh. um, she was wondrous in what she was able to dig up. And then the counterpart to that are the archivists at the various archives. These are people, the archives for them are like their babies. And when you as a researcher come to them and say, hey, do you have something like this? And we are kind of looking like, it's like you asking them to show, the, show you their baby who nobody else had asked about in a month. And so they are passionate. They are so excited. And if you can develop a close relation, relationship with these archivists, you will never regret it. These are wonderful people. We got um, we had a screening of the documentary at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library, and the head of the Presidential Library called out the archivists um, who who worked with us because at, at, at that screening we had over 500 people in the audience, and they all gave them an uh, uh, applause because. Without that archival footage, the story can't be told. Mm -hmm. And without that passion of these archivists who know just where to look and what to find, uh, you, can't, you, you can't put it visually together. And as a documentary, of course, it's all about showing. It's not about telling, telling, telling. It's right. about showing what it is that you want people to understand. And without the archival footage, that's not possible. And so... I, I have so much more respect for archivists than I ever did. And, and I think they are the most wonderful people out there. And what they dug up at the presidential libraries, any kind of phone call recordings or pictures. And um, because Peace Corps is not, uh, historically was not very well covered and to this day isn't very well covered by the media or any kind of uh, scholarship, it wasn't, the, the collections weren't so vast that they would just throw up their hands and walk away. Mm -hmm. They would come up with these treasures and bring them to us. And then, and then um, one piece that was particularly interesting was we had a, uh, we, we recorded in the Dominican Republic and we were lucky enough to get a return Peace Corps volunteer who had served there in the 60s to come, come down to the Dominican Republic while we were there and introduce us to his counterpart. So this was Kirby Jones, and he introduced us to the the women he worked with while he was there, and um, and so we could record their conversations and and uh, did interviews with them. But one of the things he showed me was that there had been an interview done by uh, I believe it was CBS that a crew had come down, interviewed him in 1965 as a volunteer about the revolution. And he gave, showed me that DVD and I looked at it. I'm like, fantastic. We have to have this in the film. Yeah. The wild goose chase that it took to 
find the actual footage and and figure out where it was. It, it, we spent so much time with various archivists to try and unearth that. It was one of the last pieces that we actually then found and were able to put into, into the documentary. I used the DVD footage that I had as, as placeholders until then, but we needed to get the real footage because we needed it to be broadcast quality, of course. And mm -hmm. um, so, so there are some really good stories of finding materials that the pamphlet Pest Corps, when, when there was Russian propaganda against the Peace Corps, I kept reading everywhere, so much Russian propaganda and, and the, the Russian radio and TV and, and, and pamphlets and whatnot. And I'm like, where is it all? I, I, I can't find it. Where does anybody have it? And I found a researcher who was writing a dissertation about the Peace Corps. And she says, oh yes, I found one thing, here it is. And, and she shared it with us. So there's so many cookie trails to follow. And I think that would be a really good advice for any documentarian. Start your archival research early, mm. um, have somebody who you can work with, who can be dedicated to doing that and make really good friends with all the archivists around the country and internationally. Yeah, definitely great advice there because the, the, the stuff that you have there is just, it's gold. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> Yeah, very cool to see the Peace Corps volunteers who were like part of the, the revolution for sure. <laughs> yes. So uh, what are your, your next steps for the film? Unfortunately, I'm sure like you, I know that you had screenings planned that had to be canceled or postponed. Um, so I know that it's really difficult right now to predict <laughs> what will happen, but um, what are, what are your hopes that will happen? Well, it's a challenging time for everyone, but for documentaries, the uni unique um, challenge is that we have to reinvent distribution in many ways. So the initial plan was we would have our premiere, which luckily we had in September before the pandemic came around um, at the Kennedy Center. And from that premiere on, we would have community screenings across the country internationally. We would have film festival screenings. And then eventually we would go to um, um, a theatrical outlet, uh, a theatrical release, and then um, broadcast and streaming. So we were in the midst of the community screenings and our film festival screenings when suddenly we can't gather anymore mm -hmm. person to person. So now what do you do? If you go to just releasing your video online, then that can impact any broadcasters wanting to show your film because it's already available online. Why would they now want to show your film or, or streaming organizations like Netflix or such? So you have to be really careful. You can't just switch to, Oh, I'll just make it available online and people can pay and see it kind of like a DVD a, a stream it for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, we don't, didn't want to stop people gathering and, and watching the film. And so we started shifting to what, is starting to become common in documentaries is the virtual community screening. So mm -hmm. you make a streaming link available for a couple of hours, a specific, a specific a specified window of time. And then a group of people will come together. They watch it around the same time. And then they gather in a, in a virtual meeting and you could do a Q and a or a discussion about it. And it still feels a little bit like a community and an exchange of ideas and, and the whole point of the documentary about connecting and, and bringing people together rather than further apart. Also, we decided we would do a virtual theatrical release and we were lucky to get picked up for distribution by first run features um, documentary distributor. And so first run features um, has just uh, announced via press release that starting May 22nd, we will have a virtual theatrical release. So that means that movie theaters around the country will offer the film. And what you do as a community member of that movie theater is you buy your ticket and then you get a link from the movie theater and watch the film, stream the film for yourself. And that works really well because it helps two things at the same time. It helps keep a small business, an independent movie theater house or so alive. And you can, as a community member, help keep your local business going. And at the same time, it gets the story of the Peace Corps out. Um, so we are having our virtual theatrical release starting May 22nd. And, you know, if you have a movie theater that you love and cherish in your neighborhood, ask them to sign up and then they can, sh they can show the film as well. 
And then uh, we're also in conversation with uh, with Netflix, and we're in conversation with uh, public television, and we're reaching out to uh, CNN and and hoping to find a good home broadcast wise or streaming wise to get the film out there as broadly as possible, so mm-hmm. that when this pandemic passes and it comes time to connect again as a global community, that we aren't dominated by fear and and wanting to build walls and isolating ourselves, but that we can get back to this understanding of it takes all of us. Pandemics don't respect borders. Climate change does not respect borders. And, uh, and you know, President Sirleaf at the end of our film says as much. So it's a, we want to tell the story of hope and the story of connection as something that can help us move forward as we come out of this. Yeah, for sure. I'm so glad to hear that. And it sounds actually like a really fun way to connect with other people to, through through these virtual screenings. Um, so I, I'm glad that the, the film is available that way. And how can we get more information about the film and where, like how we can do the virtual screenings and stuff like that? Absolutely. So our website is very simple, PeaceCorpsDocumentary.com. So at PeaceCorpsDocumentary.com, there's a button called screenings and you just click on it and it gives you the options of host a screening. And there's information on how to host a screening and you can get yourself a screening license and then and then we send you the link and um, you let your, your tribe know, you let your group know who wants to watch it. Everybody gets the link. You decide on a time. Everybody watches it at the same time. And then you gather in your Zoom meeting or whichever platform you use to gather um, and have a virtual happy hour while discussing uh, the Peace Corps and the future of our global community. Nice. I love that. See, people can gather across the world that way. They don't even have to be in the same place. So that's, that's cool. That's exciting. Okay, two big questions to wrap it up here. Um, my first one is, what was the biggest mistake, or at least a big mistake, that you made while you were creating this film? You know, I read that question over and over again, and I was going through it in my head, thinking, what would have been the that big mistake, but I don't think we had one big mistake. There were always little mistakes along the way and tweaking and and trying to figure out how to do it better. Uh, I wish, I wish I had known this pandemic would, would be coming and I could have made myself wiser about digital distribution earlier. Mm. Uh, It feels like I, uh, I'm having to learn new technologies now that I wasn't prepared, prepared to learn or expecting to learn at this point or this quickly. Um, I, I wish we had more time, but then six years is, is more time than enough to mm-hmm. do a documentary. But you always wish there was more time and you could have started earlier. And um, maybe digging into archival footage earlier would have been more helpful and, and, and learning about the processes of the various archives and, and the licensing fees and such, because those will will be expensive. And, and um, the beauty of our archival footage was that we also were able to be, or crowdsource a lot of our archival material from former volunteers, which gave it kind of that nitty gritty volunteers in the field field feel. Um, but yeah, there were no big stumbles. There were lots of little stumbles that that shaped the story into the story that it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so unfortunately, I don't I don't have a big aha moment. <laughs> That's okay. I think there were some really great points in there, actually. And I'm sure uh, the the point about learning about digital distribution is definitely something filmmakers will be more cognizant of moving yes. forward, because you never know what, what will happen in the world. And, uh, and there might actually just be some great digital opportunities out there that um, people wouldn't have thought about before. So, yes. um, And then finally, what is the best advice you've ever been given? And this can be related to filmmaking or otherwise. I think I have to go back to Brie Murphy, Mm -hmm. who at that breakfast, when I met with her, who said, you need to tell your own stories and you need to stop trying to climb through through a hierarchy that's really just postponing what you really want. And, and just pushing my, pushing myself, making that leap, like, like that leap to the all Honduras reunion of recording interviews, that leap to not being behind the scenes, a second assistant to the B camera. Not that there's anything wrong with being second assistant to the B cameras. Those guys work hard. Guys and gals work very hard. Um, but 
clearly what I wanted was something very different and I needed to, I needed to do that. So my love will always go to Brie. Um, unfortunately she has passed away, but, um, if you ever get the chance to read up on camera women in, in, in Hollywood, early camera women in Hollywood, she would be in those books. Yeah, that is great advice. And I, and I love ending on that. So thank you so much, Alana, for speaking to me. This has been um, really informative. And I think uh, the, the, our uh, listeners will, will get a lot out of it. So it was great thank to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening. I hope you got a lot out of that. I know I did. And all of the links for uh, A Towering Task the documentary will be in the show notes. I hope you have a chance to see one of the online viewings. It is a really fantastic film. If you were ever in the Peace Corps, you will, of course, love it. If you've ever had a family member in the Peace Corps and wondered what the big deal was or what they even do in the Peace Corps, or if you're just sort of generally wondering right now, what can we do to help the world? Uh, I think this film will offer you a few answers with that. So thank you, and I will talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.